Family, I want to be really real with you for a minute. We've talked about it, and you know mental health is serious. That's why I'm so excited that BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, is a sponsor today. It doesn't matter if it's something interfering with your happiness, or if you're like I was on the imposter syndrome episode and just can't seem to stop your mind from racing. The point is, when you need help, you need it. And BetterHelp is a credible, affordable, and accessible online counseling option that's safe and private. It's not a crisis line, but it is professional coaching done securely online. You know how we get down here, and we say what needs to be said, and ain't nothing wrong with getting help. Life is hard, and you know what life while black is like. All I'm saying is sometimes we need a little help. Stress, anxiety, trauma, better help can support you through all of it. I want you to start living happier today. As a Wild Black listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash wildblack. Join over a million people who have already taken charge of their mental health. Again, betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash wildblack. Peace. Y'all some experts, but then you told the people in Flint that they should boil their water. Boil it. Even if you are an eighth grader in physical science, <laughs> you know that if you have a heavy metal in any type of liquid and you boil it, it's going to make that metal just go crazy. It's going to make it more potent. It's going to make it stronger. And so, you know, you have a city of people who are leaning on the very entities that are supposed to provide guidance to aid in our well-being that's literally giving you bad guidance that is not just detrimental to your health, but it's lethal. 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 Welcome to Wow Black, a seriously opinionated podcast, bringing you the real and raw on anything happening while black. If black culture's there, we're there. If you're pissed or empowered, then let's talk about it. Ride with us on this all black everything. Everybody, welcome back to Wild Black. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are back on our teaching shit. I want to talk about something that honestly, I don't, I don't think we talk about a lot or enough even. It, it affects a ton of people much more than we really realize. It's, today's about climate change and environmental justice. It's about the war being fought, and most of us never report for duty. In, in, in recent news, most of us are aware of what's happening in Flint, Michigan. We'll talk about that today, right? We're definitely going to go into that today. But what we don't talk about is how much larger these problems are than just Flint alone, right? And as we always do, we got a dope guest. So to take us deeper inside of this environmental racism and environmental justice, I want to welcome Miss Latricia Adams to Wild Black. And before she speaks to you, I want to tell you just a little bit more about her. Latricia is a professional, an educator, and an activist. She's also the founder of the National Environmental Justice and civil rights nonprofit aptly named Black Millennials for Flint. It's an organization with a mission to empower communities and take action and advocate against the crisis of lead exposure, specifically, specifically in African American and Latinx communities. Basically, if I had to sum it up, I would tell you that Latricia is a superhero fighting a battle that not enough people know and recognize how badly we really need to win. So with that, Latricia, welcome to Wild Black. Please tell the listeners just a little bit more about yourself. Hey, but, but first, a superhero. Superhero, you're what, right. What, superhero. So, Latricia, what would your superhero name first before you get into it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my superhero name. So I am... You better hold Memphis see. down with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Memphis ain't got too many superheroes right now. Got to hold it hey, down. Hey, now wait a minute. Hold up, hold up. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, so I would say my... Um, my superhero, and I won't be cliche, is, is really my mom. But outside of that, in the movement, it's going to always be Angela Davis. And the reason why is because she just is so unapologetic. I remember as a small child just looking at like old interviews of her, and she just would sit up in front of white men and get them all the way together. And I'm like, mm. that's who I want to be. That's what <laughs> uh, I'm talking about. I grow up. So. She definitely is just so inspirational to um, the, the work that I do and the way that I try to lead. 
Well, thank you all so much um, for allowing me to come on. Um, it's such such dope work that you all do. Um, as an educator, I'm always excited about um, just really diversifying the ways in which we engage with people um, and really make our platforms multifaceted so folks can, from all walks of life, can have access um, to educational awareness um, and just be in tech with the, with the movement. Um, but a little bit about myself. Um, as mentioned a little bit, I'm a proud Memphian, um, born and raised. I like to say that I am a Memphian by birth and choice. I uh, grew up here. I went to the University of Memphis for undergrad. Um, did decide that, hey, okay, Memphis is dope, but I need to go see some other things. Um, <laughs> spent some time. Um, I was a teacher. And so while in the classroom, I decided like, wow, we have an issue um, specifically with our black and brown baby. And I pretty much thought, didn't know what my ministry was, but know that knew that it was beyond um, working directly in the classroom. So from there, I actually moved to the D.C. area around 2012. And that's kind of where my um, activism and community organizing just really blossomed. And so in 2015 is when the country began to learn um, a lot more about the Flint water crisis, even though it actually uh, started in 2014. It just goes to show how it takes so long for folks to listen to Black people. Yes, indeed. Um, and to be honest, I was really pissed off um, that there hadn't been a lot at that time. Um, there hadn't been uh, enough, in my opinion, um, of support from some of our legacy civil rights organizations, even some of our um, our grassroots organizations. And the top reason after reflecting is because we um, kind of have been pushed out of our own movement. The environmental justice movement uh, was established by Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. And when I say Latinx, I'm talking about brown people, because it is there are white Latinx folks. Um, so I wanted to make mm -hmm. that perfectly clear. <laughs> so fast forward, you know, I recognized that it wasn't much, but it was something. And so fast forward into 2016, I met a young lady, Black Girl Magic, a whole power grad, University of Michigan grad, a Black scientist. Um, her name is Michelle Naps, and I would be remiss not to uh, mention her. Uh, met her. In January of 2016, had not seen this this woman before. And so she said, you know, I, I like what you did, you know, to help Flint. That's really dope. But did you know that, you know, lead issues are not just pervasive in Flint, but, you know, in black and brown communities everywhere. And to be honest, and I, I don't know how familiar folks are with uh, D.C. culture. <laughs> D.C., you know, they got the little brag culture. So I'm like, okay, you know, well, it's nice meeting you kind of energy. <laughs> but what really, what really captivated me is she said, did you know that Freddie Gray experienced childhood lead poisoning? Mm. Now, if you think about the timeline, you know, there had been absolute chaos um, in Baltimore due to police brutality with the murder of Freddie Gray. So it was still raw, right? Um, and so I'm like, dang. You know, like, okay, so tell me more at this point. And so it was a realization like, damn, I got all these degrees because don't we brag on these degrees? Amen. And I didn't know about this. Because we paid for so them. Was, Somebody okay, paid for them. It? Somebody paid for them. Um, <laughs> and so I hit up the tribe like, yo, did y'all know that this was going on? Then we began to like peel back layers like, see what's going on like in our own city. Like what's going on in Memphis? A mess. What's going on, you know, in Baltimore? What's going on in D.C.? What's going on in Flint? You know, and we started to connect those dots. And so that's when Black Millennials for Flint actually came to be. Mm. Uh, but that was a long one in the intro. But that's kind of like good. me, how I got into the environmental justice space. And it just has been a, a hell of a ride since. <laughs> it keeps going. Well, now that the people have gotten a chance to hear a little bit about how you got where you are, we want to we let them know 
you. We want them to get a little more personal with you. So yeah. we're going to jump into this okay. wild black shit. Brother, you ready? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so our wild black shit works like this. Three questions. The last question is our signature question. The first two questions really get you warmed up, kind of ready to go, kind of off the wall kind of questions. And I'm going to hit you with the first one. So long. put your imagination hat on and imagine that you were black. You were handed a membership. Being black, you, you had a membership basis like that of a frat or sorority. And you expected the community to be able to vibe from some of the same stimulus like music. Um, you know how we get down. In that, what should be played at the cookout that you would expect all members to sing along to, rap along to, or and or hit the dance floor and know how to move to? So I'm going to go with back that ass up. That was the first yes. one on my mind. Yes. You know, um, and the reason why I say that, it's intergenerational. You know, yep. <laughs> and I'm like my mom is about to get out there and, and do something to back that hey, up. Mama. That's, that's my choice. Hey, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like that. Back that ass up. That was the one. I like your vibe, man. I, I, I'm, I'm with yeah. it. I yeah. am with it. You know, I try. Mm. Okay. You did that one? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's have a little fun. What are three things black folks stereotypically don't do? Excellent question. Um, the first thing that we don't do um, is if we see someone running, we're not going to go to see what the source of the matter is. <laughs> Amen. We're going to continue to get the hell out of there, to get mm -hmm. the hell out of Dodge. Get the hell um, out of Dodge. Get the hell out of Dodge. Yep. Um, the second thing is we don't eat everybody's food. Damn right. Um, I mean, and I'm it's I'm not fucking with your potluck, sir. Right. Yeah. Like, it's cats. I just, I'm convinced On that our ancestors saw something, like, centuries ago, because that's, like, one of the big, like, griot type of narratives. Like, look, white folks sometimes have these cats on these counters. They knew, and they passed it down from generation to generation. So mm -hmm. we don't eat everybody's food. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the third thing that I would say that we don't do is we, you know, for the most part, we don't act a fool with our parents, specifically our mom. You're real careful. We're really careful the way that we speak to our parents. So especially when it comes to um, discipline. So it's not going to be all this, I hate your mom and, and things of that nature. I, mm, 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 mm. I don't know. I don't know not one. There was one kid in 1957 who said, fuck you, mom, to his mom. And she was a black mom, and ain't nobody said it since. We've all learned that lesson. It was not, I think it was January 1957. She, she slapped that. him so hard, yeah. it went into the genetic sequence of every African-American yeah. in, in yeah. history. We studied that. That was yeah. freshman year at Southern University. We studied I forgot his name, but... I remember the size of his face. The left side, the left side was super swollen. <laughs> right, he had five yeah. fingerprint marks on his face. Yeah, yeah. I do. I think it was January 1957. Mm -hmm. I think. So we coming up on the anniversary. Yeah, of that. it's coming. <laughs> and that new sequence that got added to, to the African American <laughs> experience. I love those three though. Those, those. You hit those. All right. The signature question. What do you love most about life while black? You know, what I love, I was actually talking to um, one of my best friends, childhood friends. I really, and this is going to sound real lame at first, but it's not. I really enjoy being a black woman. And it's going to be real biased, which is dope as hell. Mm, like, it's all good. I sit Bring in your so bias. many In so many rooms, you know, whether it be in virtual rooms now or what have you, and literally, like, just reflect to myself, like, I'm the baddest MF in here. Like, I'm smarter than everybody in here. Like, literally, I'm going to let everybody in here talk. And then, of course, when a Black woman speaks, you know, everything typically is going to be resolved. Um, I think that, you know, we, we talk about... Um, like, Black women, you know, being the, the backbone and being strong. You know, it 
it's it's a blessing and a curse where I think that sometimes we're often robbed of our femininity. Mm -hmm. Um, However, um, I embrace it. Um, When I think about uh, even how we define femininity, it, it shouldn't be considered from a place of being weak. All things within the, the, the feminine aesthetic is, is strong, yeah. you know, from what our bodies can endure, um, you know, even intersecting like environmental racism. Like the fact that black women can't give birth with all of these stigmas, that all of these things, you know, against us is just, it just demonstrates like how it's nobody else. There's no <laughs> other human being <laughs> in the planet. Like a black woman. I call that. I, I call I that wish a, wish a motherfucker would energy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's in the black woman's DNA too. Mm-hmm. Matter Absolutely. of fact, I think the, the the damn genetic code is wish a nigga would. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's in the deep. Mm-hmm. I think everybody want that. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm, <shit. laughs> cool. So we'll we'll go ahead and move into our dope quote, and our dope quote is. Something out of history, science, politics, religion, theology, it really doesn't matter, but comes from the mouth of someone black and has impact on black folks today and is hyper relevant to our theme today. And so I want to read today's dope quote and then get your thoughts on it. Here we go. If we talk about the environment, for example, we have to talk about environmental racism, about the fact that kids in South Central have a third of the lung capacity of kids in Santa Monica. And that's by Mr. Danny Glover. What do you think when you hear that quote? That it's not it's not even a thing. It's a feeling. I'm pissed. Mm, right. And I'm angry. It it makes me actually think about like uh the whole like uh Malcolm X, like, you know, when you it's not about being sad. When people are angry is when you start to see action. I think that while it is heartbreaking to hear. I do have a sense of optimism and hope that these issues that have literally existed like since colonizers came over here, messed uh, messed over the Native Americans, then stole us from Africa. These issues have been present. You know, it's awful that it's taken hundreds of years for it to kind of make the main stage. But having, you know, uh, these influencers, you know, on the culture to amplify issues surrounding environmental racism. Even when you think about the influence of young black and brown people forcing these uh, presidential candidates to incorporate environmental justice and using the right terminology, right? So not just climate change, but call it what it is. Mm -hmm. It's environmental racism for, you know, the Biden-Harris administration to actually say those words you know, is is epic. So it it's a it's an unusual feeling, but very typical of black people where I feel hopeful, I have the faith, but I'm still mad as hell right. that this is still occurring. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So since it's still occurring and I think it's something that people need to be closer to, let's start with the the obvious place, right? Most of us have heard about Flint. So jump in and tell us more about what was really happening, what's happening today, and why it was such a hot topic. So in Flint, we have to start the conversation out by talking about environmental racism. But specifically, we're going to flip it. We're going to talk about white supremacy. All right. Um, One of our favorite topics here. the fact that uh, a group of, of white men decided that <laughs> they were going to make this switch um, to the Flint River. And you think about the history of Flint. It's Vehicle City, right? right. Yeah. It's a huge manufacturing city, you know, adjacent to Detroit, you know, same issues. And you really thought that it was okay to switch to this water source where literally it has car parts that are corroded, that have been in, you know, in this water for decades, you thought that it was okay for you for just to save $100 a day. That's how much value you put on majority Black lives to save money. 
you know, on like the most, the, the hugest necessity that we have, which is water. So let, let's start there about how this, this man-made disaster even started. So you have that part, you know, with the switch that took place in 2014. Then let's talk about like how white supremacy just kind of radiates through environmental racism. So it's not even isolated. So we think about like the neglect of other stakeholders. So we think about the EPA, which is still trying to evade responsibility. Now, the EPA, all of its employees are funded and paid by, you know, taxpayer dollars. If your role is to provide accountability and oversight to states, you know, also, you know, to local government agencies and municipalities, how are you not, how, how you think you're going to skip out? You also were in the mix, <laughs> you know, this as well. And then let's talk about how white supremacy actually removes power from black communities. So what's even more disgusting about um, the Flint water crisis is the fact that we have this now creation of emergency management, where you have these white supremacists that find black minions. I hate to say that, but it's true. All skin folk ain't skin folk. That's right. Yeah. And you have this facade of a, 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 you put this black plant, you know, into the black community where it's just the same thing as being on a plantation. It's an overseer mentality or structure where it silenced the voices of the leaders in, in Flint, Michigan, where it, it makes local government have their hands tied and a whole city that doesn't trust anyone, and rightfully so. It's just, ooh, it just, it just makes my blood boil to even think about the beginning stages of the Flint water crisis. And specifically, um, I'm going to bring it to EPA. So EPA, now you got all of these supposed smart folks, and you know the majority of them white, just go keep it real. They're supposed to be so educated, so degreed, all of this, this you know, uh, experience and expert. That's why folks' favorite word, expert. Y'all some experts, but then you told the people in Flint that they should boil their water. Boil it. Even if you are an eighth grader in physical science, <laughs> you know that if you have a heavy metal in any type of liquid and you boil it, it's going to make that metal just go crazy. It's going to make it more potent. It's going to make it stronger. And so... You know, you have a city of people who are leaning on the very entities that are supposed to provide guidance to aid in our well-being that's literally giving you bad guidance that is not just detrimental to your health, but it's lethal. Yeah. Um, so you have that part of it, you know, and then now fast forward, like an EPA said, well, we didn't have anything to do with it. You know, the issue was on the state. No, it's all y'all white folks that decided that you were going to make this decision about this majority black city, this poor city. And then, you know, when I think about things that I've seen with my own eyes and it goes beyond, you know, we appreciate the activism and the amplification that happened, um, you know, very early on in a crisis, but to actually see see the impacts, to hear the stories, to see people with rashes on their arms, on their backs, babies with rashes all over their body, to hear the stories of women who miscarried. One of the first people that I met when I went to Flint was um, this sister where she miscarried twins and her child that still is, is alive has been suspended since kindergarten at least 50 times. Wow. So we're not even just talking about like the, the physical impacts of the Flint water crisis, but and, and all the that, all that's been tied back to the lead in the water. Yes. Wow. Yes. So how, just, just for clarity, how, how did the lead get into the water? Essentially, um, your experts, which was white people, um, I'm using air quotes, but you can't see it. Um, <laughs> we, we can feel them. Yeah. We, we, we felt, felt that vibe. Yeah. You sent it through the airwaves. <laughs> So essentially, the state of Michigan, of course, including Rick Snyder, who child, um, the former governor um, of the state of Michigan, he prides himself on being a data nerd. 
decided that, you know, because Flint was in dire straits as it related to money, you know, just generally operating, the, the city was on the verge of bankruptcy, that they needed to cut some corners, you know, to, to, to get some money to make it more financially fit or stable in the city of Flint. Now, from a theoretical perspective, yeah, you know, we, we need for our cities to be fiscally responsible and healthy. But what, what, not, what should not have happened <laughs> is for there to have been a switch to a different water source. Now, Flint had been using the Detroit water source for decades and decades and decades. Mm-hmm. And so the switch was very controversial. And there had been scientists that, you know, like, hey, this ain't it. Like, this ain't the right move. And so essentially, when the switch happened, there were not the appropriate agents that would prevent lead from leaching um, from the pipes. So in water, um, especially if you're like in a quote unquote rust belt, that like that's the the whole Midwest, um, also like places in the Northeast, so like your Phillies, your DCs, it's old infrastructure. Yeah. And so if you don't have the appropriate agents in the water, if the water is not treated appropriately, then you have a Flint water crisis. So because those appropriate agents were not included in the water treatment, it essentially made the, the pipes um, become corrosive. And so lead began to leach out from the pipes into the water. And then in addition to that, remember I talked about like how dirty the Flint River is. Right. So even if the if this had happened with the Detroit water source, the water is being treated appropriately. So you could have been able to, you know, kind of reconcile it. But the fact that you did the switch and you didn't use the appropriate agents, it -hmm. just became a disaster. Yeah, like a compounding. Um, So it literally was a slip up that could have been avoided completely. Mm. You know, I think the for Flint, it, it it gives the impression that it's only in like the African American communities that this water is actually affecting people. Is that is that accurate or is it? So that's actually not accurate. I'm glad that you brought that up because now we're talking about the intersection of class and right, race. They don't care about poor white people either. They don't care about poor white people. You know, and when you talk about white supremacy. Sometimes like with, um, because I'm from Tennessee, you know, it's all sorts of interesting uh, white characters in the state. And I'm like, they don't like you either. Like, you really need to band together with the black folk, you know. But, you know, a sister was just on an IG Live um, talking about the Flint water crisis settlement. But the overall, the average income in Flint is like, around $22,000 to $25,000 a year. We're talking about for households, right? That's, how, that's how does that match up with the, the national averages? Ooh, child. Um, so I, uh, uh, and I'm like, I don't want to be, I don't want to misquote, but You're okay. I would say that that is approximately like half of what the, the average is um, oh. for, for a U.S. average. So it's extremely low. Gotcha. Um, and then Ooh, it, it it's just a mess. So taking that into consideration, so yes, it's a majority black city. It's also a a poor city. You know, going back to the history again with you know manufacturing and you know with the the plants being there for um, cars. You know, once that shifted, that was devastating economically to the city of Flint, and you also had so many people to leave. Um, the Flint area. So, you know, when you have a, a, a mass exodus from a city that's physically small, that has extreme detrimental um, impacts on the economic vitality of the city. So, yes, there are also white people, you know, white families that were impacted, but they're not the white folks that other white folks, your uppity white folks, really care about. And so I think what happened in Flint is a perfect example of how this country at large needs to wake up where <laughs> you don't necessarily, black people are not the enemy. Racism is not the, the only entity that is involved in white supremacy. It's yeah. also issues of classism and elitism. And mm-hmm. you see that with, with what unraveled with the Flint water crisis. 
So let me but ask But what's her. really messed up is like, even when you're Black, you can be wealthy, right? So even like your wealthy Black families in Flint, like you still have the same like environmental racism yeah. impact, right? right? Regardless of how much money you have. Yeah. You know? so, so maybe from your experience and expertise, is is the environmental racism more targeted to African Americans or a class of people as it relates to like a financial class or is it something more? So it's both. I would say um, if I had to rank it, I would definitely say that racism is the the number one and it's not even me saying that. So they're... Um, like, for example, like Harriet Washington, um, which has wonderful books around um, environmental racism. So race is the number one indicator of all sorts of environmental hazards. Um, so when you think about like the proximity of um, black neighborhoods to chemical plants or refineries, um, that becomes the determining factor. Now, the, the class part, the, the money component, you know, it is secondary, but it it is very much so like connected. And so it's kind of like white folks just kind of get caught up in it because they don't have money. Now, if you white, you know, you moving on up like the, the white version of the Jeffersons, you know, you can kind of escape um, some of the issues that um, around uh, environmental injustice. But with Black people, again, you could be wealthy. You could be a wealthy Black person and still succumb to the issues surrounding environmental justice. So quick example. So when you think about Black maternal health, the fact that we talk about climate and we hear so many people of all races talking about climate, especially this year at the presidential election, Black women are still the most impacted uh, with climate as it relates to maternal health. So that's maternal health like with uh, with uh, uh, maternal morbidity. So black women who die while trying to give birth um, and also includes, you know, just being able to take your baby to term. And this is regardless of how much money you got as a black person, how many degrees you have, it still is the main indicator when you talk about environmental racism. Mm. So other other than what's happening, actually, before I ask that question, let me ask this. Flint's been going on for a while, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Going on seven years. Um, what does resolution look like? How are the people in the affected communities being compensated? How are things changing? What's happening now? So interestingly enough, um, right before the holiday, mm, Right before the holiday, there was a hearing um, with uh, Judge Levy, who um, will be, be the ruling judge with the current Flint Water Crisis Settlement. There were ooh, at least like 150, between 175 attorneys who were on, who've been working with various cases, whether they be um, class action lawsuits, individual lawsuits. Um, against various entities ranging from the, the city of Flint, um, the state, um, and then also in some instances, um, cases against the EPA as well. And so on that call, um, or excuse me, during that hearing, you have two categories, so two different things going on. So from a city of Flint perspective, the city of Flint is afraid of the city going bankrupt because they got to pay their legal fees, right? So you have issues with like paying legal fees as well as like your uh, insurance. So they're looking at a $20 million uh, out, uh, piece of debt, right? Or on behalf of the city of Flint. So they're like, look, we got to get this taken care of. We don't want the city to go bankrupt. We don't want there to be another issue like we had before at the beginning of the Flint water crisis where we have emergency managers and a state trying to take over the city. Okay, I get that. But on the flip side, you also have a settlement that is completely unfair. So within that settlement, now we'll say like a, a, 
the positive thing is the majority of the funding um, excuse me, of the settlement right now, um, as it stands, the majority of that money will go towards kids. But here's the kicker. So you have to have proof. But when you think about what lead testing entails, when you get a blood lead level test, lead doesn't exist in your bloodstream forever. After a while, it deposits into your bones. Mm. And so they're very expensive and very rare tests where you can get a bone test to, you know, get an assessment to see if there's lead deposited in your bones. But there's literally about three places, three in the United States, not in Flint, in the United States that does this particular test. So who got access to that, right? So with you now saying that you have to, you have to exemplify this type of proof you have that barrier that's created. You also, with the settlement, are not taking into consideration that lead creates a cumulative body burden, meaning that um, sometimes when you are exposed to lead, um, issues might show up later down the line. So there could be cognitive issues, there could be um, other neurological issues, um, mental health issues, Again, like you could have issues as a woman, like with your reproductive health, even with young, you know, with men, um, there's issues that could come up with, um, you know, you you being, you know, being able to to produce healthy sperm, you know, to have a baby. So there's a, a lifelong impact with lead, which is not being taken into consideration with the settlement. There's also a lack of consideration around the in-home damage that happened. So because the water with the switch was so corrosive, like think about all the appliances in your home that operate with water. We're talking about folks' refrigerator not being operable anymore, the um, sinks and um, plumbing not being safe to, to, to use anymore, people's showers, washing machines. There's nothing included in a settlement that speaks to that issue. Mm -hmm. There's not enough protection as it relates to like the the huge impact, negative impact on property value. None of those things have been taken into consideration. And so the pushback from, you know, attorneys (laughs) is that, well, this still, you know, is the think it's it's a six hundred and twenty five million dollar settlement that's on the table. Mm. But that doesn't even include the chunk that has to go to the legal fees, right? And so how is that justice? The $625 mm-hmm. million, that is mm-hmm. the settlement that's going to be delivered to the people who are affected by what happened in Flint as far as the lead in the water, correct? If you qualify, quote unquote, or if you are eligible. So it's not like blanketed. Mm, so right. you, have to get, you have to be deemed eligible. To, to receive money. So you can literally be impacted if you don't have uh, the right type of proof. You right. might not get anything. Oh, shit. So then this, this settlement was arrived at without consideration for the number of people impacted. This is just the number that they've come up with through whatever formula or equation. And yes. now the process begins where people have to apply mm-hmm. to receive some portion of the settlement based on some additional criteria. Yes. Wow. Ain't it a mess? Do Do you it's have like any idea what the criteria is? What 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 allows them to qualify to be a part of this? Yeah. So in the in the hearing, um, there the formula hasn't been or it's, it hasn't been made public. The judge Levy did push back to say, okay, like what is what all is being considered like with this um, formula. She had a lot of questions. I, I'm going to give her that. But she like, look, I don't care what y'all saying. And I'll take, she literally said, I'll take two days, all day, if I have to listen to every single Flint resident that has concerns with the, the settlement as written. Um, so the, the formula has not been made public. Um, I know we as an organization with Black Millennials or Flint, we had questions like, who did you consult with or who are you consulting with with um, coming up with this equation? Like, did you talk to Black or or Latinx, like, statisticians? Like, who's who's creating this formula? You know, because this should not all be in the hands of attorneys. 
you know, no shade to attorneys, but we know how attorneys work. You know, yeah, it, that, it's automatically like not equitable. So, yeah, and it's not getting national news at all. So yeah, like, I had, until you mentioned know. it, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, a zero idea. Yeah. Any idea how many? Well, let me, let me back up. And you, you, <laughs> you may have answered this question in part, but what are the what what are the qualifications? Like how I understand that you know it, it came to be through some magical, mysterious way, but what what do you have to prove? How do you how do you demonstrate to the powers that be? Yes, I should get whatever portion of this settlement after the lawyers take their fees that people will get. How do you become part of the, you know, I don't want to say it this way, but how do you become part of the chosen few? How do you become one of the ones who suffered directly enough to be paid or compensated? So I, and I definitely don't want to misspeak. I'll just speak more from a general perspective. So a lot of it is connected to um, like what your, like from a medical perspective. So a medical assessment. Mm. I know, for example, one thing that, came up that's extremely problematic. And it, this does go into like my purview uh, from an education perspective. So when you think about the, so right now, post Flint water crisis, the amount or the frequency of children who are now receiving special education services, I mean, has beyond doubled. And so of course, like with lead exposure, um, having, uh, being a neurotoxin, it still becomes really difficult to determine like what specifically, you know, caused this child to have these particular issues from a a cognitive um, or from a mental health perspective. And so now in a, in a typical eligibility, um, if you have a child that is uh, requiring uh, special education services, you can get a sign off from the actual school district, the parent, and a child psychologist, right? And so now the state of Michigan is making um, a requirement that you also have to get a sign off from a pediatrician. But here's the issue. So yes, if you have like a a health-related issue, like a physical like issue, yes, then you would need to get um, the recommendation or sign off from uh, a medical physician. But if you're talking about something from a a, a brain perspective, right, from a, a cognitive, a psychological perspective, then why do you now need both? For any other instance, like you would just need the child psychologist, right? But now there's this other layer. When you add on this other layer, guess what? That's some more money <laughs> that's going to have to be spent that's not going to be in the pockets of Flint residents. So yeah. it, y'all, it's just, it's so much. That's so that's like another part is with qualifying um, or being eligible. It requires money to, to determine like if you are eligible. And so you're talking about a, a city that is already poor. Where is this going to come from? You know, I know that that didn't, that didn't answer your question, but that's just an example of like yeah. <laughs> what that eligibility process looks like. Yeah, it just sounds like another layer of oppression, right? When you think about one, you, you've impacted the community significantly, like not just, you know, in, in the generation in which you, you, you made this decision, but this is going to have lasting effects for generations to come. And it seems so unfair and so um, calculated that mm. y- you would add an additional barrier to a problem that individuals who may not be in a situation to to, to get that level of care as it relates to health to prove a case to get money when you know emphatically that the city and the EPA, the so state and federal, are both in the wrong. So it it, it just a, it sounds like a compounding state of oppression. Like even even that layer is 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 it, it just does not seem like it should be um, it should be right. Like even even the dollar amount, right? It, it would be interesting to see. How did, how did you come up with the six hundred twenty-five million? Right, like what what was the the thought process there? Was that was that related to how much each individual child or man, woman, or family or household would would receive? You know, it it it, it sounds bad. Did, it sounds mm-hmm. really bad. Did any 
any criminal, any criminal action come out of this? Not a nary person has been held accountable, has gone to jail, has been charged. Zero. Well, not one. That's crazy. Yeah. Right, I guess, so one, one question I want to go into, right? We just finished an election cycle. And so whereas it's too late to go back and impact our vote and who wins or whatnot, and, you know, there's, there's definitely some merit there. I'm kind of happy about that. But ultimately, when it comes to the power of the ballot, the power of our vote, from an environmental standpoint, what should we be considering? How can we create action to help us in these situations? So um, the first thing that I would say is there's too much leadway with states having an option to choose whether or not they're going to do something. So for example, quick example, and something that we focus on a lot with Black Millennials for Flint, there is not a federal mandate for testing for lead and water in schools. As a state, you have a choice. What? There's, uh uh-huh. And so Michigan Specifically in schools or or throughout the water system itself? So throughout the so throughout the water system itself. So the way and then EPA just released in this a mess, that's a whole other conversation. They just released new rules for the lead and copper rule, um, which lessens the accountability for local water or utility um companies or what have you. Um, to replace pipes. So there's an issue there. And then even with um, like the samples that you are allowed to um, to take or to test is very limited. Um, so I'll give you an example here in Memphis. Like you can do 50 random samples. 50? We got almost a million people in this city. So 50 samples. And you talk about random sampling, like it's not even... Um, really made transparent about like what methodology did you use? How are you choosing these 50 samples? Um, so all of that to say is it relates to, you know, this current administration that's about to come in. There has got to be mandates, not just choices. And so that requires um, our federal agencies like the EPA uh, to have more teeth. So not just providing guidance, right? Not not just providing oversight. Flint is a perfect example. When you provide an oversight and it's not real consequences, as a federal government agency, all you can do is I'm looking at it. Y'all look, I'm telling y'all what's going on. But it's like, what's the now what? Like, what is the consequence? And so there has to be a complete overhaul of what... Um, what accountability looks like in this country. Um, and it first starts by there being actual laws that govern um, water quality, that govern um, oversight and accountability from these um, climate killers. <laughs> so like your, your oil refineries, your chemical plants, um, there's just too much autonomy and flexibility to kill people without any repercussions. Mm -hmm. Um, So that it has drastic changes um, at the federal level so that there can be more teeth and more power to come down on these uh, multimillionaires, billionaires that are literally killing black, brown, and poor people. So what Mm -hmm. can the everyday person do? Like they, they care about this stuff. They want their community and other communities to be stronger and better. What can, what can they do? So, you know, and it, it, it definitely sounds a, a bit cliche, but you can, think, you can think and work, you know, globally, but work locally, right? Um, so the biggest thing that I would say, and we've seen success with, with, the, or with our organization, Black Millennials for Flint, is we give people resources to get people together. And I know that that's not a a conventional saying in this space, but we give people the tools to hold your local elected officials accountable and also like your local utility companies. So I'll give you a quick example that I I get excited about. Um, So um, specifically shifting from from Michigan, but um, in Memphis, 
we had a an, a, an older woman to reach out to us um, and said that she received a letter in the mail from the EPA. Now, you already know the deal. Who can understand this technical language in this letter from the EPA? That's a whole nother separate conversation. And so essentially, she was like, what does this mean? Like, I've been trying to get EPA to respond to me. I've been trying to get help from the city. No one is responding. Can you help me? And I'm like, yes, ma'am, you came to the right place. And so what we were able to do is to help her to navigate um, through what that looked like. So being able to <clears throat> advocate on her on her behalf, but then also connecting her with her, you know, frontward facing elected official, like this is your constituent. Black millennials for Flint, we don't get paid by tax dollars for yo uh, being an elected official, right? Like we don't work for the the local um, utility agency. And so what we were able to do, we were able to get a um, a meeting with EPA for them to provide transparency on what are you all doing, you know, about um, this issue that you all cited. Like, what does that look like? What are you going to do to mitigate um, the the situation? What is your connection with the city? Are y'all communicating? You know, it becomes a series of questions that's community led. You know, we're we're done with constituents and community members feeling like they have no way out, like they have absolutely no voice. What you're not going to do is to continue to ignore the voices of your everyday resident. Um, and so, you know, being able, especially since we're in COVID, so a lot of your like local um, city council meetings or county commissioner meetings, however your local government is set up, is virtual now. So you can put them on blast. If they're not answering you, it's on public record. We do public comment training. We teach people like this is how you get people to listen that have the power in decision making. So that's the first thing is like, run up on these folks. Your elected officials work for you, not the other way around. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yep. So that has been how we've been able to support your everyday person. That's something that you can do. Why, why you talk about elected officials, just out of curiosity, in the four years of the Trump administration, did those hurt or help us from an environmental justice, environmental racism standpoint? Listen, a whole mess. Um, so Trump rolled back um, over 125 environmental protections. So we're talking about things that have been established like as far back as the late 70s, early 80s, just for no reason. Um, it, it was very <laughs> clear. You know, it's just like, why are you why are you touching stuff? You don't know what's going on. Come in here and sit down and don't touch nothing. Um, and so essentially within these four years, the, the power has been within major polluters. They have been encouraged and given, you know, financial support to continue to poison our 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 country. And of course, you know, black and brown people are impacted the most. Another thing that I think is extremely important, and I'm hoping as so many people with this particular election has been or have been more civically engaged, Trump's cabinet, specifically um, who he appointed um, as the uh, EPA administrator and for the Department of Interior, was absolute garbage. I mean, they like, you know, Kiki with your major oil people and all sorts of other major polluters, like hand in hand, like their best friends, you know. And so with making those type of appointments, you know, essentially they're in the ear of the administration saying, nope, that's not how we're going to keep this money flowing. You're going to have to roll it back, you know, at the expense of the lives of Americans. Um, so I talked about hope earlier. So I will say, you know, and Biden wasn't necessarily, you know, even the fourth choice for some folks. Um, I will say that um, some of the appointments that he has made um, definitely will put us on a path to restore 
we can't even talk about making stuff better because dude has come in there and tore some shit up. <laughs> so um, it, it has to be a place of restoration and reconciliation first before we can even think about like moving forward to making things better. Yeah. So Biden actually got a good like slogan like build back better child. We got to fix everything that was broken. Wow. Um, Trump did a number um, on from an environmental perspective um, during his term. It, it just was horrific. Sounds like we got some some promise for the future. <laughs> of we, we of at least building it back to what it was before. <laughs> Right, which is still raggedy, which was still raggedy, you know, yeah. but, you know. <sighs> you know, I, n- I never thought about um, environmental justice as it relates to it being a, 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 a issue for African Americans. I've always thought about it as just being a socioeconomic issue just simply because, you know, not having awareness to, to, to thinking about, like, environmental justice and what it is. So it's, 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 it's interesting to hear. Um, that that's an, an avenue of where someone can make a difference on behalf of, you know, the coalition of black people. It's also um, from an economic perspective and something that we're really trying to expose our, our young people to. You can make a lot of money trying to um, actually replenish or repair the earth, right? So when we talk about a green economy, one of the things that we advocate hard for is, yeah, that's all well and good when we talk about a green economy, but are you prioritizing people who are directly impacted with having access to um, those jobs? So when we talk about infrastructure, Trump had a, a, a big uh, platform in 2016 around infrastructure. Child, nothing happened. You know, and uh, Biden, the Biden Harris administration wanted to continue on, you know, with the focus on infrastructure. Um, and we talk about uh, also energy, um, clean energy uh, specifically, uh, definitely, you know, a great opportunity for black wealth. Um, and we want to make sure that there's accessibility um, to these opportunities as well. Um, I'll be honest and, you know, Panda, I didn't know anything about like this whole sector, right? Because as black people, you know, especially being a Southerner, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a teacher. You know, there's these very prescribed <laughs> professions that are, you know, well, I have boomer parents um, mm-hmm. tell us to do, but yeah. there is a vastness of opportunities, especially now um, that Black people need to have access to, and I definitely don't want us to be left out of that. Yeah. But that's also something to take into consideration. Absolutely. Well, we're we're getting toward the end of the interview, but I, I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about Black Millennials for Flint. Where are you all going as an organization, especially as the settlement comes to fruition in Flint? And how do people keep up with what you've got going on? Yeah, so as it relates to the settlement, uh, we're working really diligently um, since we do have um, a bit of a, a national connection. We're just trying to get more amplification around it. You know, we think that just like, you know, in the beginning of the Flint water crisis, we need that same type of energy um, as we get into this settlement. Um, to keep up with what we're doing, um, of course, you know, we're, we're young. Well, I'm an older, I'm an old school millennial, but I guess I could still be considered young. We guy. are still very young. much so... <laughs> You in the millennial category, you young. You know, definitely follow us on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, We also have a very active listserv. Because we um, service four different um, cities as far as direct service, um, that's how you can really stay connected with what our programming looks like. Um, Also, you know, check us out at www.blackmillennials4, that's the number four, flint.org. Um, We have a really robust uh, website that goes into great depth around what our programming looks like and then also ways that you could potentially get involved in some of our our programs and causes. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, At the end of every episode, we always give our guests the opportunity to take the mic and tell our listeners whatever it is that is on your heart to share with them. So. 
This is your opportunity. Please tell Wild Black whatever it is that you think you need to tell them. Yeah, so my my message um, to, to Black folks, and I'm going to use my privilege to be able to use profanity because that's my favorite. We like that. Mm. Stop taking shit from people, period. I think, you know, we need to um, elevate our voices from, from all walks of life. We need to stop having a kind of messiah complex where people think that they can speak for the Black community. We can all work in concert, but everyone has their individual voices that works collectively um, to make one powerful statement. Um, I, I think about you know other movements like the LBGTQ movement, where you can't just define one leader. It, it's leaders that have you know existed and been successful all throughout fluidly um, the movement. And I think in order for us to press forward, especially from an environmental justice perspective. We can really learn a lot from that type of structure. Um, you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be degreed up. We all share this planet. And so we all have um, the wisdom, the insight around what our planet, what our environment needs to be in order to sustain um, a healthy life and well being. But most importantly, Let's not give a raggedy world to our children and our children's children. Let's work collectively to um, make this better because we're borrowing this earth from our children. Um, and we want to make sure that they inherit greatness. That's a reflection of the greatness of Black people. So I love it. That's my message. Well, nice. Tricia, thank you for joining us today. I'm sure the listeners will get quite a bit out of this. And I'm just happy you came and, and blessed Wild Black. All right, brother, you got anything? Yeah, my, my daughter is a, is a seven-year-old environmentalist, so I, I can't yeah. wait to, to inform her of, of some of the things that she can do. Good I luck. love it, Christus. Well, thank you all <laughs> so much for the opportunity. This has been great. Cool. Indeed. Well, Wild Black, we love you. Peace. We out. We out.